Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. Okay, well, welcome in, everyone. It's Thursday, and here on SEU's campus, it is homecoming week. Oh, my gosh, what an exciting week. Everybody's donning their red and black and celebrating the traditions and getting ready for Forever Red and the big football game on Saturday. But one of the things that's really great that's become a tradition is with Apex, the lecture series at the university um, that those of you who listen to the show are very familiar with, has um, a three-year now collaboration to celebrate our outstanding alumnus for the year and invite them to come speak. And so this year is no exception. And it has been so exciting and wonderful to have Julie Castle in on campus again, and um, to have her in the studio. Um, Julie is currently the CEO of Best Friends Animal Society, right in our sort of in our backyard a couple hours away in Kanab, Utah. Welcome to the studio. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Yay. Well, thank you so much for your talk today. And um, I'm sure that I want to try, I always try not to duplicate too much that was said earlier. But what I'd love for you to start with is just kind of give us a little snapshot of how you came to Best Friends. I know it's a great story. Yeah, I um, had graduated from SUU and I worked in the school relations office back then it was called and was basically over all of the recruiting and that sort of thing. And, um, I had, it had always been my intention to go to law school. And so I'd spent my entire life really leading up to that point and got accepted into a really great school, the university of Virginia. And, um, so I knew that once I entered law school, life as I knew it was going to be over. (laughs) And, you know, so some friends of mine and I decided, hey, we've got this little window of opportunity to just be totally (laughs) irresponsible until I have to go to law school. So we decided to head to Mexico in my uh, 1979 Dodge Colt and stay there for as long as we had money. And so when we ran out of money, we decided uh, that that would be the time to come back, obviously. So we, we went down there, um, and sure enough, ended up running out of money. We had just enough money for gas and a candy bar each. <laughs> and so we started the trek back home and we were going to swing by Cedar City and then go up to Salt Lake. And, um, one of the friends that was with us really wanted to stop at this animal sanctuary in Southern Utah and over by Kanab and begged us. And I said, no, we're not going to stop. Everyone's tired. So eventually we capitulated because she was so insistent that we go there and see the animal that, you know, she'd been sponsoring. And so we ended up driving into this magnificent Red Rock Canyon. And in fact, it's the canyon where a lot of the old Westerns were filmed. Right. And it is stunningly beautiful. And it just totally captured my imagination on every level. That and also the story of the people who started it, the founders, and how they really started a movement called the No Kill Movement. And so I was so taken by it that uh, I called my dad and I said, hey, dad, I'm not going to law school. And Mm -hmm. I moved to Kanab. Wow. Can you tell me a little more about that, those first days there? Because I know I've heard the story and it's just, it sounds like it was just a really, uh, that you were just immediately transfixed. I mean, was it uh, just a completely physical react? I mean, can you tell me a little more even about that, those first days? Yeah, I mean, 
<clears throat> it is, um, you know, it's a a bit of a, a weird, it was such a left turn for me. And I think it was a left turn for a lot of people that knew me uh, who thought, wow, this is, is she having a midlife crisis? Like what's (laughs) happening? And so the first, um, when you pull into that canyon, everybody remembers that Mm -hmm. the first time. And it's one of the things that, because we have about 40,000 visitors that come every year and the first thing that they remark on is their uh, that first time they pulled into the canyon and how it changed their life, yeah. how it's a transformative experience. And so just the beauty of the place was the first thing that hit me. But the second thing was the philosophy of the founders. Mm-hmm. And back then, it was a really small, nobody knew about this organization really, but all the founders, and there were about 25 of them, Oh, 25, wow. Yeah, and they all came from really interesting backgrounds. Most of them were, you know, Cambridge and Oxford graduates. Wow. Just really smart people who built the place with their bare hands. Yeah. And none of them had any construction skills. How did they find each other? So they all met in college. Oh. And, um, you know, it was back in, in the era it, it was back in the 60s. Yeah. And so there was a lot of turmoil in the country, Yeah, way more in England than in America. Oh, right. You don't think of that, but yeah, yeah. absolutely. And they bailed. They were like, we don't, you know, we don't do not want to stay yeah. here around all this turmoil. And they moved to America. And do you know how they, how did they find Kanab of all places? So it's so funny because they were looking for a sanctuary. They were looking for a place to start the animal sanctuary. And they had their sights on Sedona. Like that was their first choice. Oh. Um, they were, had looked in Malibu. Um, mm-hmm. believe it or not, Granada. Oh, wow. And so there were a lot of different uh, choices. And one of the big features was water. Oh, right. And um, you don't think of Kanab as having a lot of water, but this canyon in particular is unique in that it has, it's on top of this magnificent aquifer. Oh. And there's a lot of natural springs there. And so... um. The first, uh, the one of the founders that's going to be here tonight Mm -hmm. is the one who found it, Uh and uh, he looked at it on a map topographically, and he saw that okay, there's canyons here. I want to go see that. Yeah, and so he came out to visit, and back then, you know, the photography wasn't anything like it is now. Right, and so. You know, he went back to pitch it to the rest of the founders. And the minute he said it was an old movie set, it kind of turned them off. Interesting. And so they passed it by. Oh. And then they, you know, had a hard time finding a place. And so they revisited it. And a bunch of them went out to visit and just fell in love with it. Wow. Yeah. And if anybody wants to see it, there you offer tours and so you can you can go. I mean, cuz I think sometimes people don't know what to expect, but you can go and have a tour of the facilities and property. It, that that's still the case, I think, right? Yeah, it's uh so we offer free tours every day, yeah. 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Um and you can do a mini tour or a longer tour. And people come from all over the world to yeah. see it. And it's just really fun to meet our visitors and yeah. volunteers because a lot of them say, this is a bucket list for me. Wow, how cool. Yeah. That must be very satisfying. Totally. Well, I read that your early days at Best Friends were filled with chores that you actually started just with an employee number and kind of started from the ground up. What were, what were some of those early times like for you? So it was definitely, um, you know, because I'd, I'd come from working here at SUU. So while I was in college here, I actually was hired the last year I was a student oh. in school relations. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, you come from this kind of structure and go to that, which, which was 
completely unstructured. Mm -hmm. So basically, you'd show up to work in the morning, and I was employee number 17. Yeah. And you would just get an assignment. So oh. it was like, hey, we need you to install a sprinkler system up near this building, or we need you to go work at dogs today, or we need you to give a tour. Um, and you just did whatever it took. Yeah. And so you just kind of didn't know what you were going to be doing that day. And the drill was that everybody worked six and a half days a week. Wow. And so, you know, there, I don't think they paid much attention to labor laws in the early days. <laughs> right. And exactly. So my first paycheck was like 183 bucks. Oh, so. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> well, and that sounds like a, a tradition of work ethic that that really was installed from the beginning. I think I was reading in some of the uh, either the original founders, really, the plumbing was all kind of done from the ground up, right from from all of the original people. Oh, yeah, that's I mean, it is a it the arc of this story is really remarkable because they, um, like I said, most of them had no clue how to build anything. <laughs> and so they learned how to do everything from time life books. Oh and so gosh. all the electrical, all the plumbing, all of the framing of buildings, all of it, they learned from a book. Yeah. And basically, when they arrived on the property, there was one building, <laughs> and they had to build the entire sanctuary with their bare hands. That's amazing. Including cutting the roads. Wow. So you can imagine, like, it. it is a really remarkable story. I didn't realize that they did the roads also. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And some of the plumbing and some of the things from that time still exist, I think. They to they totally do. In fact, my husband was uh, one of the original founders, and he was responsible mostly for the electrical. Uh -huh. And I always, we always, t I tease him about it. And he's like, well, nothing's burned down. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> maybe fantastic. I did something right. That's awesome. Well, and then one more question before we take our first musical break. Um, you know, making such a left degree turn like this, um, you know, obviously it's worked out. I mean, you've done such amazing things. But in those early years, did you ever think, I mean, I know other people, you know, you said earlier today, other people thought you were crazy, but did you ever think, what What have I done? Or did it just always feel right, even though it was hard? And even though you maybe didn't know the outcome? What was it one way or the other for you? I mean, look, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I, I, I didn't pause at times and say, have I really screwed up here? Yeah. You know, and I think, I don't think having that kind of doubt is a bad thing right. because I think it's, I think it gives you a bit of a reality check, um, and helps you stay f more focused. If that makes sense, yes, it does. I totally agree with that. And you know, I but I think ultimately at the end of the, end of the day, I just kept asking myself, you know, what's going to make you the happiest, mm. and. With law school, I think it would have been awesome and challenging and all that stuff, but I really didn't want to spend my life in a litigious mm -hmm. environment. Right. So I wanted to do really do something that would change the world. I love it. Thank you. Well, I have a bunch of songs. I have a couple songs to play. Um, my first song, um, as you know, I always pull things from all kinds of different sources, but I kind of pick titles that sort of had to do with at least the love I have for my pups at home. But um, this this song is, this is called Here in Heaven. Um, and it's a part of the goat rodeo sessions. Yo-Yo uh, Ma, Stuart Duncan, Edgar Meyer, and Chris Thiel. Check it out. See what you think. This is the Apex Hour KSUU Thunder 91.1. Yeah. 
between here and death, between the wait and the wedding. For as long as we both shall be dead, to the world beyond the boys and girls trying to keep us calm. We can practice our lives till we're deaf and blind to ourselves, to each other, where we're spun like wind and spring. That summer cool, not cold. And it's warm, not hot. Well, welcome back, everyone. That song was Here in Heaven. Um, that's the Goat Rodeo Sessions with amazing, amazing, amazing musicians, uh, Yo-Yo Ma, Edgar Meyer, um, et cetera. So check that out. You're listening to the Apex Hour. We're back in the studio. I'm Lynn Vartan, and I'm joined with Julie Castle. Welcome back, Julie. Hey, thanks. Uh, if you're interested, we were talking about where you can find this show. You definitely can subscribe uh, to the Apex Hour wherever you get your podcasts. And I also wanted to make sure to let everyone know if you like the music that you're hearing on our website, which is seu.edu slash Apex. Uh, if you go to the radio hour, uh, you can find a playlist of all the songs that I've played. Every time a show happens, I put all of the songs uh, into a playlist so you can check those out. So... Anyway, back to talking about best friends and Julie's time there. And um, you're currently the CEO, but you've had many jobs there and a lot of them in, in leadership positions of programs or pro- projects. So um, I'd sort of love to talk about leadership and start out with this great uh, um, designation that you have, which I'm curious what what you think about, and that is the in-style designation of badass 50 list of one of the 50 top women in the country who speak up, show up, and get things done. I mean, that, to me, I just think that sounds amazing. Um, how do you, how do you feel about that? Is that how you see yourself? You know, it's so funny because I, um, I often joke about that being on that list because, you know, the people that are on that list are like, really, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg (laughs) and Serena Williams. And, you know, so 
uh, to have made that list is like a really tremendous honor. But I often joke that I think they needed filler. So they just were like, oh, yeah, there's this person in southern Utah that runs this animal sanctuary. No way. But, <laughs> but it, it is, I mean, it's, it's definitely, I think in terms of, I don't really think I think it in those terms. Mm-hmm. Like, do I consider myself a, uh, quote, badass yeah. or um i i don't really see myself that way i i think i'm just more tuned into a path of um really always constant improvement uh-huh. whether it be for the organization or myself or just our entire animal welfare movement i love that yeah i love I, that i think that's more that's kind of where I tune in, I guess. Oh, I yeah. love that. Yeah. Well, there's so many greats who who say things like that. I, I, I'm really happy to hear that that's, that's where you are. And I think that puts you right on that list for thinking that way. So, well, I'd love to ask you uh, kind of along those lines, we talked a little bit about mentorship earlier today, but, um, you know, just uh, thoughts that you might have about leadership, um, you know, your particular leadership style and what you think works and what maybe what you think doesn't work. If you could just talk, because I know you've led so many different projects and movements, and I'd love to know what you think about leadership. Yeah, I mean, I think I honestly learned more about leadership here at SUU ah. than almost any any place for me in in my upbringing. Wow. And part of it was the vast amount of opportunities that I had while I was here. And, you know, it was one of those things where it was almost there were too many things. Oh, yeah. And I think just the connection with the, the faculty and the students mm. and the smallness of it, that is a very, very good thing. Yeah. I mean, the fact that SUU... Uh, isn't this enormous university uh, where you kind of get lost in the shuffle? That was a a big, big draw for me. Right. And so, you know, having access to the president of the university or the vice presidents was very cool. Yeah. And I think what I learned here was a, a very service minded leadership style. Ah. Okay. It's where you are almost a servant leader, you oh, know? Okay. Um, and to me, what that means is I think it's really important that you try to put yourself in the shoes of your staff mm. and volunteer with them, you know, try and learn their job and uh, experience what they experience on a daily basi- basis so that you can really empathize with where they're, where they're coming from. Right. So for me, that's just tremendously important. And I think it's also, you know, one of the things I talk about with all of our new staff that come to work for the organization is, listen, especially these days, you spend most of your life. So when you think about life, you go to high school, you go to college, you're in school for a long time, you graduate, you get a job. Maybe you have two or three jobs. Basically, you spend 20, 30 years doing that. You retire, and then life's pretty much over, right? Yeah. And so um, whatever you choose to do for your work should be really exceptional. And to me, when I think about our employee base and you say they are spending the majority of their life with this company, boy, we better make it worth it. Yeah. It better be special. Yeah. That's amazing. It sounds it sounds really inspiring and, and wonderful. Do you meet with all of the new employees all the time? So I do a new employee orientation. Oh. Um, and, you know, for me, it's really important that I get in front of those staff mm-hmm. the minute they walk in the door, you know, so – so having a, uh, a half hour with that staff right as they're starting with the organization is really important, I think. And is it 
what do you do during that time? Do you, is it more of a cheerleading kind of thing or do you set uh, boundaries and expectations? How, what does that look like? You know, it's a good question. The way that I've used it is really um, asking them about themselves, oh. where they came from, why they decided to work at Best Friends. Um, so part of it is that, but part of it is also to really um, help them understand why I chose to work there mm. and that no organization is perfect. Right. And really, I think people, you know, a lot of people come to Best Friends and they're so inspired by it. And it's this sort of honeymoon period. Mm. And really, it is about saying, look, um, no job is perfect. No human is perfect. No organization is perfect. Um, we are striving daily to be the best place on the planet to work. Right. And so um, I think it's important for me that I just connect with them on that level and get that message across. Great. Thank you. Well, talking about the organization, um, I'd, I'd love for you to give us a little bit of a, a kind of snapshot or bird's eye view of the organization, because I think some people wonder, you know, okay, I know there's this place in Kanab. Is that is that the place? Is that it? Is Are there other? And I think, you know, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about the the overarching umbrella of the organization. Yeah. Um, so we've grown very, very quickly as an organization. And it's been fun to be part of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's been really challenging as well. You know, that saying of growing fast is just as hard as not doing so well. And I think that's very astute. Yeah. So, you know, in back in the early days, we all had to, like, we literally were a hand to mouth organization. Yeah. It was like, do we have enough money to, for the next three days? That was how we measured stuff. Wow. Wow. And so we would go out and table and we'd go to, Los Angeles or Salt Lake City or Las Vegas or and we'd sit at a table and talk about the work we did and ask for donations and that's how we built our mailing list. Yeah. So that we could, you know, send out our newsletter to membership. Yeah. And it's also how we met all of our celebrities. Oh. And so, you know, we'd be at supermarkets and a celebrity would come up to the table and you know, we'd strike up a conversation and literally almost every celebrity in the early days, every single celebrity that we had was because of that. Wow. So, and these are some pretty big names from Charlize Theron yeah. to Ellen DeGeneres to, you know, uh, Michelle Williams. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a really top list of um, uh, celebrities that yeah. support us. And so the organization really just started expanding in, in that kind of reach and particularly our membership base. And then we started expanding physically. So, uh, the first sort of, um, life saving center we opened up besides the one in Kanab was in, is in Sugar House oh, right. up in Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Los Angeles, we have two facilities out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've got, we just opened a new facility in Soho in Manhattan. That's wow. really cool. Oh, cool. And that's, uh, that's a, a whole different experience. And we've got one in Atlanta and we're about to open one in Houston. Oh, that's amazing. So, you know, it's been really cool to see the organization grow just in terms of its ability to save lives across the country and, also, I think it's helped us plug into kind of a national scene in a more meaningful way. Right. So, for example, Animal Planet, we just started a show with them. Oh, really? Yeah. So every Tuesday and Thursday. Oh, cool. Um, at noon Eastern, we have a a live television show with Animal Planet. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, That's it great. Just, we just started about... Six weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. And are they on site and just kind of checking out? Is it sort of a day in the life? What's the show like? It's so, it's it's kind of a, a new, unique concept. So they, 
So their host is based in New York City. Okay. And they toggle back and forth between our centers. So like they'll be in New York, then they'll cut to our LA center, then they cut to the Sugar House Center. Oh, wow. And so it's, and it's all about adopting pets and saving lives. Oh, that's great. So yeah, it's, it's really cool to have that kind of exposure. Okay, cool. Well, it's time for our next song. But when we come back, we'll talk more about, about um, the organization and some of the programs and some of the um, strategies and the things um, that they're, they're really putting energy into right now. Um, and yeah, we'll keep the conversation going. So the next song that I have for you is called Find Me in Your Dreams. Um, and it's Pat Metheny and Brad Meldow, two amazing instrumental musicians. Um, but again, just a great kind of title, Find Me in Your Dreams. You're listening to the Apex Hour, KSUU Thunder 91.1. Thank you. 
All right, welcome back, everyone. You're listening to the Apex Hour. This is KSU Youth under 91.1. That song was Find Me in Your Dreams. Um, Pat Metheny and Brad Mildow. Uh, yeah, so we are back in the studio. It's homecoming week. We have our outstanding alumnus for 2019, Julie Castle, the CEO of Best Friends Animal Society. Welcome back. Hey, everybody. It's good to be here. <laughs> and we just have to say that you are no stranger to the radio. And in fact, we were telling the great story that, I mean, you were you were a DJ right here with <laughs> KSUU. I was. I, uh, I was a DJ. I had the early morning shift. It was a lot of fun. That's it was awesome. really fun. <laughs> so that's really cool. I mean, it's just been so fun to watch you interact with um, so many people on campus. And we were just talking about one of the things that's really special and beautiful here is that there's this great uh, sort of tradition of continuance. You know, there's a lot of people that, that either you went to school with or worked with and are still really dedicated to this school and its legacy. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's it, that is such a remarkable thing. It's been really fun to come back and see just how many people I still know. Yeah. Whether they're a professor here still or a student that I went to college with who's now working for the – like, it's just a really cool thing. And I think it just goes to show that people – you know, the experience here is really special. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Um, I've been reading on the Best Friends website, and um, there was some – I just love how you have designed, like, the position statements on the website, and I'd love for you to maybe elaborate a little bit um, more about those. Um, one is the golden rule to treat all living things as we ourselves would wish to be treated, and going right along with that, uh, kindness to demonstrate compassion and respect for all living creatures. I wonder if you could just speak to that a little bit more um, in regards to your own feelings about that and how the organization, um, you know, makes that a priority. Yeah, you know, it's a, I think it's so, um, it is the core of our DNA. Yeah. And it is so important to us as a value in terms of just thinking about animals, about what they bring to our lives, and, you know, the fact that they all have intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the number of times that we hear people talk about how they the story is the same, it's a different person or a different animal, but it's the same storyline, which is um, – look, I rescued this dog, but ultimately this dog ended up rescuing me. Totally. And I think that there's something about these sentient beings that have that effect of there's no judgment. There's no, you know, every day that you come home, they greet you with the same excitement. And that specialness that they demonstrate in terms of – um you know, there's there's just not that uh, there's not that complicated factor that humans bring into the equation. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So the simplicity of that is actually, to me, a, a complexity. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And you probably get asked this all the time, but how many animals do you have in your home right now? So we have um, two dogs. Mm -hmm. And we have three cats. So that's our brood right now. And, and does it change? I mean, do you then take in a lot of foster animals as well? We do. So we just had two kittens that we were fostering. Um, and they, 
uh, got whisked away when they were old enough. They were neonatal kitties. Oh, wow. Um, and they got uh, transported up to Salt Lake for an adoption event, and both of them found homes. So oh, we it, that our population does change based on fostering, or sometimes – Somebody will just steal our heart, and we have a new member of the family. I love that. That's great. Um, one along with the, the 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 kindness and golden rule and some of the position statements, I found it really interesting um, that you have a statement about food um, and that uh, food served at best friends staff meetings and employee events um, and reimbursements for traveling uh, also are. Are, are vegetarian and and that that you carry out that message that way um ha, has that been going on all the time and and how what's the reaction to that yeah you know so so i personally have been vegetarian for uh almost 23 years yeah and i think that the organization has always practiced that and even more recently we decided to serve vegan, only vegan food at our, our sponsored events. Yeah. And the way that I feel about this is that I don't feel it's right for me or anybody in our organization to force that on anybody. Right. But for us to demonstrate that is very, very important because, you know, how can we be saving dogs and cats? And what really is the difference between that and a pig or a cow or a horse at, or a bunny. I right. mean, a lot of these animals are still consumed as food in Korea, China. A lot of dogs and cats are. Right. And so, you know, for me, it's, a, again, a demonstration of where do you draw the line between which animal is more important, mm -hmm. so much so that you choose to eat them or not eat them. Right, right. Thank you for, for that explanation. I, I'm definitely in agreement with that. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, a little bit of the international aspect and, and how animal treatment and animal rights around the world is quite varied. And, and we do hear about these dog meat festivals and things like that. Mm -hmm. Are there, uh, is there any plan or role that you see best friends having at, at the international level? Or maybe you already are and I, I don't know about it. Yeah, so the interesting thing is, I think just overall as a society, like when I first decided to become vegetarian, um, like people thought it was so weird, <laughs> and especially in southern Utah, you know. Right. And now it's just mo way more accepted, mm -hmm. and veganism, and you just see a lot of uh, that popping up all over the place. And so when you think about the international market, there are countries that are really still in their philosophy way so far behind. Yeah. Um, we used to do international work. Oh. And that was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we decided, um, listen, if we're really going to get to our goal, which is ending the killing of dogs and cats in America's shelters by 2025, then we really need to focus. And so we went through this exercise where we cut a bunch of programs that didn't ladder up to that specifically. I see. And it's sort of like running a marathon. You know, if you go full bore the first three or four miles, you're going to run out of gas. That's right. And so that's the approach that we took to – we just need to get super focused on this. Yeah. Okay. So, well, let's get into talking about that because that is just such an exciting goal and it's absolutely going to happen. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about the, the movement to the magic date of 2025, how it's going and, and yeah, the plan? Yeah. So I think usually where I like to start with this is just to, um, you know, I talk about how I was a history major and political science, and I think really knowing the past helps you carve out the future. And um, so the animal sheltering movement really began about 150 years ago in New York City. Mm -hmm. And it started because there was an overpopulation of dogs and there was a concern about rabies legitimately. Right. And so the people of New York said, look, please do something about this city. 
Yeah. And so the city issued a bounty of 25 cents a piece per dog. Wow. And they hired bounty hunters to go out and round up dogs. And they put all the dogs in a metal cage and dumped the cage in the East River. Wow. And that's how they killed animals back then. And um, it there are other means they used that were just as graphic. And yeah. so there was an outcry from the public to, like, don't, this isn't what we meant. And so as a society, we started building shelters. And essentially, we were killing animals just behind closed doors. And this went on for decades, after decade, after decade, until the founders showed up in the canyon in Kanab, Utah, and said, why are we killing animals? We don't have to do this. Let's talk about how to best save them. Yeah. And you think about a society where 80% of Americans have a pet. Like, people want to see this happen. Yeah. <clears throat> so they broke ground at the sanctuary 35 years ago. Mm. And back then, 17 million animals were dying every year. And we were making steady progress and... Uh, about 10 years ago, there were three no-kill communities in this country. And today, there are over 4,000. And mm -hmm. it's really cool to see that this movement was started, not only right here in Utah, but by, you know, this group of people who were really unique and yeah. considered crazy by most accounts. Yeah. But the thing is, is that in a couple of years ago in 2016, um, we felt like it was time to really get focused and push the country forward and change the world. And so we put our stake in the ground and at our national conference declared that we were going to take the country no kill by 2025. Yeah. And in order to do that, um, we had to figure out how many animals were dying Right. And how many shelters there were. And the funny thing is, in this industry, like, that had never been measured, which is insane it's considering yeah. bit the data of today, yeah. right? And yeah. technology. Yeah. So we sent a legion of volunteers around the country to gather all those statistics. And they went county by county to every single shelter, every county in America to ter determine wow. how many animals were dying. Yeah. We aggregated all that data and we put it into an interactive map, a dashboard. So yeah. you can find that on our website at bestfriends.org backslash 2025. And it basically level sets the ability for anybody anywhere to get involved in their communities. So it's a huge game changer. Yeah. And it transparently basically says, here's how many animals are dying in Cedar City. Right. Or St. George or Ivan's yeah. or Panguitch or, you know, you can find out anywhere. any any city anywhere in this yeah. country. Is there any and one thing that you wish every single person listening would do? Is it go to the site and get involved? What what if you had some one thing that you could tell any Anybody and everybody, this is the one thing that you need to do to help or you can do to help. Is there one, is there one thing? So the th one thing is awareness. Mm -hmm. It's always surprising to me how many people don't know that this is still a tragedy, mm -hmm. that we still have about 750,000 pets that we're killing every year. Yeah. In America, that don't need to be. Right. That when you've got 17 million people looking for an animal. Yeah. And we're killing 750, that like it's terrible. So I think just like spreading the word is the biggest thing. And when you're ready to add to add a, you know, a sweet puppy or kitten to your family, go to a shelter. Yeah. That's the place to go because there are great animals there. 
for sure. I know my two at home. I was like saying, I wish I could bring them to, to <laughs> school today to meet you because <laughs> I love them so much. Well, I have one more song to play. And speaking of love, this song is Where's My Love uh, by Simmel, S-Y-M-L. Uh, and so, yeah, check it out. This will be our last musical break for the Apex Hour, KSUU, Thunder 91.1. Yeah, that's my love She hides away like a ghost Ooh, does she know that we think the same? my love I am searching high I'm searching low in the night does she know that we bleed the same All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. You're listening to the Apex Hour. That song was Where's My Love, uh, S-Y-M-L, Simmel, uh, the artist. And I'm in the studio with Julie Castle, CEO of Best Friends. Welcome back for our last little bit. Um, so I have two questions that I often ask, um, which are sort of fun and silly. But the first question is, uh, if you met the yourself from 10 years ago in a bar fight, if you met you from 10 years ago in a bar fight, who would win? Who would win that fight? Oh, well, <laughs> kind of question, right? <laughs> that's a really great, you know, here's the thing. I, the, the me of today would totally just absolutely trash the me of 10 years <laughs> I ago. I love it. And the, uh, I'll tell you the reason why is, is that, at a young age, I was diagnosed with uh, highly aggressive cancer. Oh, wow. And I nearly lost my life. And oh I got treated at UCLA for two years. Wow. Um, and that was the me t 10 years ago. Wow. So I was diagnosed with, uh, with that 10 years ago. And it really 
gave me a whole different perspective on things. I see. I know that was supposed to be a fun question. No, but I but mean, it's a, it was a um, no. Thank you for sharing that. Real uh, game changer for me. Yeah, that's so, amazing. I mean, yeah. that's that's kind of part of the. It, it can be fun, or it can be you know a really a wonderful insight into where you were then. And so, thank yeah. you for sharing that. My last question: You can make of it what you want, but it's kind of based off of the. Um, yeah, that like what's turning you on what's making you happy this kind of thing this week and this could be anything it could be a tv show I, I i think i heard somewhere you're a game of thrones fan it could be a song it could be a book it could be anything and but i always like to ask all right julie castle what's turning you on this week so what's turning me on this week is a book i think everyone should read which is called radical candor okay and it's all about how to communicate. And it is such a powerful book. And really, I you can trace most of our problems of today, either if they're personal relationships or with other organizations or whatever, back to communication. Oh my gosh, I love it. So go buy the book. It's really awesome. Okay, the title again, so everybody can hear Radical, Radical Candor. Candor. Okay, yeah. I'm going to get it tonight for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. We've well, been listening to the Apex Hour. Julie Castle, CEO of Best Friends Animal Society, has been in the studio with me today. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I really appreciate it's it. It's been so much fun. Thank you, and I'm happy to be back. Yay. Go T-Birds. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.